Folks, if it, we're going to um, get started in just a moment with our keynote. So if you could uh, settle down, I guess, take your seats. That would be great. <laughs> just no problem. We're having such an interesting discussion. Well, I have to introduce you oh, now. Okay. So it, it, it is um, our distinct pleasure at both CLIP uh, and CITP uh, to welcome uh, Commissioner Julie Brill as our keynote speaker. Um, this is your, I think, second visit to one of at our conferences, second. Second, at least second visit to one of the conferences. Uh, and we're, it's always a, a real special treat to have uh, Commissioner Brill come uh, and, and headline our, our, our conference. Um, I know it's also a uh, a, a great treat for Princeton since she is a graduate of Princeton University. Um, <laughs> yes, Ed, Ed made me say that. Year, <laughs> I, of course I wouldn't say that. Um, uh, Commissioner Brill has been on, on the Federal Trade Commission three, three, three years now, three and a half years, um, has really one of the country's leaders in protecting consumers, uh, particularly in, in the privacy sphere. Um, I think she holds the distinction of probably being the only person to serve in senior leadership positions in two state attorney general's offices, uh, starting out in Vermont, which is actually when we first met uh, testifying before Congress in the FICRA hearings, um, and then served uh, as the senior deputy attorney general uh, and head of consumer protection in antitrust uh, in North Carolina uh, before being appointed to the, the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, she, she is really known as one of the country's outstanding leaders uh, in privacy regulation and, and, and privacy enforcement. I think the laundry list of awards uh, that she's run, it, it, it has won, uh, is enormous. Uh, most recently though, your law school alma mater, I believe, gave you uh, an honor, what, just two weeks ago? Yep. Um, for her uh, leadership work. So it is a real pleasure um, to welcome Julie back to Fordham and hear her thoughts. I'm really pleased to be here and um, I'm very glad Joel did not mention the year I graduated from Princeton, although let me just say that it looks awfully different there now than it did mm, 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, Thank you, Joel, for that great introduction. And um, thank you to your center, CLIP, and uh, to the law school and to Princeton for inviting me here to speak today. I always enjoy speaking about the benefits and the consumer protection challenges of all sorts of rapidly changing uh, technologies. And the Internet of Things is clearly one of those. Um, and, and it is uh, also just one of the fastest growing facets of a world that is becoming much more data intensive. Connecting cars, appliances, and even clothing to the internet promises to deliver convenience, safety, and through analysis of the torrent of additional data generated, potential solutions to some of our most intractable, intractable problems. But turning on this data flood also creates privacy and security risks for consumers, challenging us to consider how to apply basic privacy principles to the internet of things. Each of us in this diverse audience, technologists, lawyers, industry leaders, and other stakeholders, has a role to play in meeting this challenge. We already celebrate birthdays on Facebook, 
and share our thoughts and our selfies on, Twitters, on Twitter. We used to have, uh, we're, used, we're used to having our smartphones always on and at our side so we don't miss a beat with our colleagues or with our kids. And we know that our credit card purchases, online and in the store, are tracked. Our daily activities as consumers yield an enormous amount of data. Overall, 1.8 trillion gigabytes of data were created in the year 2011 alone, which is equivalent, as some of you have heard me say, but I just like to make this real. What does 1.8 trillion gigabytes of data in one year mean? What it means, it's the equivalent of every US citizen writing three tweets per minute for almost 27,000 years. Individuals are estimated to create 70% of all data in the world, and it's predicted that the total amount of data will double every two years from now on. According to one report, the data broker Axiom processes 50 trillion data transactions per year. Scientists are tackling the many challenges of what's known as extreme scale computing, including experimenting with immersing servers in mineral oil to keep them from melting down. Perhaps more important than the rapid growth in available data is the proliferation of data sources. One company estimates that there will be 25 billion internet-connected devices by 2015. That's an average of more than three devices for every human being on the planet. And I don't know about you in the room here today, but I already have many more than three devices, and I bet most of you do too. By the end of this decade, 40% of data will come from sensors. So our constant connections are about to become even stronger. In January I of this year, I traveled to Las Vegas for the Consumer Electronics Show. Um, behind all the flash of the show, and frankly, the flash of Las Vegas itself, was one unmistakable message. Let me see if I can do this. Is this the controller? And I just go forward like this? Oh, it's here. Hit enter. There we go. This is the unmistakable message of the Consumer Electronics Show. The Internet of Things is here. Companies were showcasing their connected devices everywhere. And I began to wonder how long it will be before we start to ask why a given object isn't connected to the internet. So let me give you a few examples of some of the things that I saw. Okay, picking up on Bonnie Eisenman, I don't know where she went, where is she? There she is. Um, her wonderful uh, uh, prototype of a, um, a pillow that will allow you to monitor sleep. This is a product um, that was being showcased at uh, the Consumer Electronics Show. It's a connected baby onesie. It's called the MIMO, which, and it can monitor a baby's respiration rate, body temperature, and activity level. Only a bit more sophisticated than what you were looking at, Bonnie. And it can send the data to a smartphone app. According to the vendor's website, parents can even configure the app to set alerts and even display analytics about their baby's sleep. For parents who are worried about SIDS or simply trying to figure out how to get their infants or themselves to sleep through the night, the data from their own nursery might be very useful. Now, if we're connecting our kids to the internet, it's no surprise that many of the devices that consumers use each day in their homes are also becoming networked. Thermostats, refrigerators, ovens, and lighting systems are just a few of the household necessities that can talk over an internet, over, over a network. And these types of appliances were all over the Consumer Electronics Show back in January. This can make life more convenient for consumers. We'll be able to make sure we've turned down the heat even after we've left the house for work. And getting out of bed to turn off the kitchen light might become a thing of the past. As we heard uh, on the last panel, cars are becoming not only computers, but also data sources with wheels. Already, some cars allow you to call ahead and start the air conditioner before you reach your car on a hot day, or to receive safety adjustments without ever going to the dealership. 
One expert reported that some cars have more than 100 computers in the vehicle, and manufacturers are providing consumers with the ability to run apps and connect to the internet over 3G networks. Convenience is only part of the story. Scientists, entrepreneurs, academics, and policymakers see the potential for this vast expansion in the data available about us to solve important social challenges, from reducing the amount of gas we waste sitting in traffic jams, and more efficiently managing our energy consumption, to achieving breakthroughs in healthcare. The potential benefits for these kinds of discoveries can bring to that, that these kind of discoveries can bring to society are enormous and, from my perspective, exciting. But consumers, policymakers, and academics also see risks to consumers in these vast storehouses of data. A recent report from McKenzie put the privacy challenges of big data in stark terms. McKenzie says, privacy has become the third rail in the public discussion of big data. The Internet of Things shows how deeply personal information will be abundant and easily available. Connected devices will offer a detailed view into where we are, what's happening in our homes, and what our children are doing. The very nature of these devices marks a major shift for consumers, who until, until now have had but a few devices, smartphones, tablets, and laptops, that mainly serve to connect them to the Internet. Going forward, consumers will have a multitude of devices that could generate data that is accurate, as Scott pointed out, abundant and sensitive, and if combined with offline and online data, could have the potential to create alarmingly personal consumer profiles. Now is the time to ask how companies can provide this burgeoning connectivity and its considerable benefits without compromising consumers' privacy or losing their trust. Will consumers know that connected devices are capable of tracking them in new ways, especially when many of these devices have no user interface? How will these new sources of data flow into the huge constellation of personal data that already exists? Will companies that, for decades, have manufactured dumb appliances take the steps necessary to keep secure the vast amounts of personal information that their newly smart devices will generate. These are some of the big data challenges, uh, big data privacy challenges presented by the Internet of Things that I think we all need to address. One of the most troubling risks, from my perspective, coming from the collection and use of big data is its use in making sensitive predictions about consumers such as those involving their sexual orientation, health conditions, religion, and race. A well-known and even infamous example is Target's so-called pregnancy predictor score. And I actually think I first talked about Target's pregnancy predictor score when I was here two years ago because it had just come out, the article had just come out at that point. But now, two years later, I'm still talking about it. <laughs> Using, because it's so important to think about it as an example. Using retail transaction data, Target was able to calculate not only whether a consumer was pregnant, but also when her baby was due. <clears throat> Target used the information to win the expectant mom's loyalty by offering coupons tailored to her stage of pregnancy. And data brokers, entities that most folks know nothing about because they're not consumer facing, are going far beyond this in the profiles that they develop from vast amounts of online and offline data. A recent GAO report states that at least one data broker includes in its profiles about consumers information about 28 or more specific diseases, including cancer, diabetes, clinical depression, and prostate problems. According to a Senate staff report released last December, Another data broker keeps 75,000 data elements about consumers in its system, including the use of yeast infection products, laxatives, and OBGYN services, among other health-related data. And we rec recently read reports about another company that analyzes innocuous data from social media and the like to predict disease conditions like diabetes, 
obesity, and arthritis in order to persuade particular consumers to join medical trials. All of this creation, collection, and use of health information is happening outside of HIPAA, outside any regulatory scheme to protect this information. It's not hard to imagine the devices that I mentioned earlier or their close cousins feeding data into this system. Location, lifestyle, and all kinds of consumption habits could easily become available to data brokers and other analysts. Their inferences could soon be enriched by hard data from smart devices before consumers even know that their devices are connected to the internet. And perhaps this would be the outcome. <laughs> it takes a little while to get it. There are two main reasons to be concerned about the vast amounts of personal data coming from the Internet of Things. First, we should all be concerned about the use of deeply sensitive personal information to make decisions about consumers outside a legal regime that would provide notice and an opportunity to challenge the accuracy of the data. We will pay a price if data is inaccurate, misused, or through a security breach falls into the wrong hands. And we will pay a price in a lost sense of autonomy in a society in which information about some of our most sensitive aspects of our lives is available for analysts to examine without our knowledge or consent and for anyone to buy if they're willing to pay the going price. Second, we should all be concerned that questions about privacy may keep consumers away from the Internet of Things because they do not trust it. Some argue that companies so clearly see the need to keep consumers' trust that they will play it safe with consumers' data coming from the Internet of Things by offering strong privacy protections. During our ongoing national discussion about NSA surveillance, national security and privacy, the President and other leaders at the highest levels of government, as well as leaders within the business community, have recognized that the trust of individuals is essential to the success of programs and services that are built on big data analytics. But as we've seen from the internet of PCs, cell phones, and tablets, pressures within an industry can encourage companies to collect and share more and more personal information while weakening privacy safeguards. I believe that unchecked vacuuming of our information is not inevitable, that we can and should place some limits on untethered collection and retention of personal information about consumers. But the Internet of Things and big data analytics have led some to call for a, sh for a shift in the emphasis that basic privacy pr principles should receive. Proponents of risk-based frameworks call attention to, to the difficulty of refraining from collecting unnecessary data and providing consumers with meaningful notice and choice about data collection and use. These advocates argue that companies should instead take on the burden of assessing which uses of personal data pose risks to individuals and taking on the burden of developing appropriate safeguards. Now, I am very much in favor of encouraging companies to think deeply about privacy risks, but I also believe it's essential for, com for consumers to be involved in decisions about data use. That's where transparency and control adapted for the data-intensive Internet of Things comes in. So to answer Sophie's question, the student Sophie's question from earlier this morning, I believe the question is not whether the FIPS apply, because they clearly do to the Internet of Things. The question is how we will apply them. Figuring out how to adapt our privacy framework and develop adequate transparency and control mechanisms requires us to think about the roles that consumer-facing companies, as well as non-consumer-facing companies, might play. Many of you in this audience work for, counsel, or consult with these companies. You have an excellent opportunity to make companies aware of the privacy risks they face, that is the companies face, and to steer them toward practical solutions for consumers and for the companies themselves. And from my point of view, you can't start too soon. 
The practices that companies adopt as they build new internet connected devices and services will have profound effects on the personal data environment that develops in this ecosystem. Fortunately, the FTC and many others have been addressing privacy challenges as new technologies and business models from online commerce to behavioral advertising to mobile devices have rapidly grown and evolved in recent years. The best practices that the FTC described in its landmark 2012 privacy report go a long way toward providing strong and appropriate consumer privacy protections with respect to the Internet of Things. I'd like to highlight just three of these basic, uh, of these best practices. The first is privacy by design. Because many connected devices will have little or no user interface, it is especially important for companies to promote consumer privacy in their products and services and throughout their organization. Excuse me. <clears throat> privacy, <clears throat> so sorry, <clears throat> I get all choked up about this. <clears throat> privacy and ethical considerations are an increasingly hot topic among technologists in academia. As more and more schools provide their science and engineering students with this additional training, my guess is that smart companies will find better ways to put privacy and ethical considerations into practice. Robust de-identification of personal data is another best practice that developers can use to protect privacy in the Internet of Things. As Scott Peppett pointed out on the last panel, this is especially important in this space because of how uniquely identifiable some of the Internet of Things devices, the connected devices, um, that the information they generate will be able to pinpoint us to an individual. The FTC's best practices for de-identification strike, I believe, an appropriate balance and include both robust de-identification technologies and social agreements to not reassociate de-identified data with particular individuals. This means that companies should do everything technically practicable to strip their data of identifying markers. They should make a public commitment not to try to re-identify the data. And from my view, perhaps most importantly, they should contractually prohibit downstream recipients from doing the same thing, that is from re-identifying data that has been de-identified. The technical prong of this framework poses challenges that researchers are continuing to tackle with an eye toward the Internet of Things and beyond. And third, connected device developers should recognize that effective transparency is a fundamental building block of consumer privacy protections. The Commission recommends transparency improvements, including shorter, clearer, and more standardized notices and machine-readable notices, which could make it easier for consumers to understand what data their new devices collect and transmit. Others are suggesting entirely new ways of providing notice about data collection and use of connect by connected devices, such as visual, auditory, and tactile cues tailored for a specific device, and comprehensive immersive apps or portals that could give consumers a comprehensive view of how their devices are collecting and disclosing data. In addition to focusing on the developers of connected devices, I believe we must focus on the behind the scenes data collectors who are creating rich profiles about consumers. If the data broker industry wants to build consumers' trust and gain the benefits of this trust, I believe the industry needs to take some affirmative steps to change its relationship with consumers. This would be a wise investment for the industry even if the Internet of Things did not exist. But it is critical to making the industry a trustworthy participant in the data-driven ventures that the Internet of Things could spawn. Legislation such as Chairman Rockefeller's and Senator Markey's Data Broker Accountability and Transparency Act would help. But the industry needs to take action even before legislation is enacted. 
To this end, I have urged industry to join a comprehensive initiative that I call Reclaim Your Name. Put simply, consumers should have more knowledge about and control over decisions like how much information to share, with whom, and for what purpose to reclaim their names. This is how it would work. Through creation of consumer-friendly online services, Reclaim Your Name would empower the consumer to find out how brokers are collecting and using her data, give her access to information that data brokers have amassed about her, allow her to opt out if she learns a data broker is selling her information for marketing purposes, and provide her the opportunity to correct errors in information used for more substantive decisions. Improving the handling of sensitive data is another part of Reclaim Your Name. As the data that participating companies handle or create becomes more sensitive, relating to health conditions, sexual orientation, and financial condition, for example, the data brokers would provide greater transparency and more robust notice and choice to consumers. And the user interface is critical. It should be user-friendly, and industry should provide a one-stop shop so consumers can learn in one place about the tools all data brokers provide and the choices consumers can make about the use of their data. Solving these privacy challenges is critical to ensuring that privacy is woven into the fabric of the Internet of Things. Strong privacy and security protections will sustain the consumer trust that will help the Internet of Things and big data reach their full potential to benefit all of us. Academics, technologists, lawyers who counsel companies that are building the Internet of Things, consumer advocates, and policymakers all have a role to play in developing these protections. The time to start is now. Thank you very much. more than happy to. I'll, I'll kick off while, while people there's a are... Couple, there's a couple over there, too. Sure, no, no, go. go. Are there questions? Yeah. Sure. So uh, I'll repeat the question. The question was what Commissioner Brill thought about the data breach notification discussion that took place in the earlier session today. So it's, a, it's obviously a very hot topic. The Target's uh, uh, breach and some other big breaches that have gotten a lot of attention um, have, I think, raised the profile of, um, uh, of the need uh, at the federal level to consider enacting data security legislation as well as data breach notification uh, legislation. Um, you know, Congress is very busy. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. Um, but I, I do think that if any privacy or security legislation is likely to be enacted, it would probably be this. I can't say for sure whether it would be enacted, but I do think there's a lot of attention being played to this, uh, being given to this issue. Um, so I actually separate out data security legislation from data breach notification. I think we need to discuss those separately. So most of the discussion this morning was on data breach notification legislation. My view is that um, at the federal level, it would, it's fine to enact, and I support, as, does, um, all, as do all the commissioners, support a federal data breach notification law. Um, as we heard, though, a big part of the discussion is whether or not it should be preemptive, that is, preempt the 46 plus juris state jurisdictions and territorial jurisdictions that have state laws on this issue. And my view is that should be the end of the discussion, not the beginning of the discussion. I think what we need to do is see what the federal standard looks like and whether it's worthy of preempting the state laws. The states have different kinds of laws. There is, there's a little bit of difference. I don't think it's quite as complicated as was portrayed. Um, Joe, I understand um, your point that any complication adds costs, and I think that's absolutely right. Um, frankly, I was um, leading the privacy working group of the states for many years while this discussion was underway in the state legislatures. And much of the um, differences in the state laws actually was introduced by business interests who, who were pushing different issues in different states. Be that as it may, there are differences in the state laws. Um, 
And I think one of the biggest issues is when notice will be given. What is the trigger for notice? What we also heard today is another very important issue is what's counted as the kind of breach, that is what kind of information that might be breached uh, will also trigger the law. So those are trigger notification to consumers. So those are two very important issues. Um, at least with respect to what kind of harm, or if there is a harm test, the states have at least three different laws. Some say there's no, you just have to notify whenever there's a breach that fits the right category. It's not, there's no issue of whether or not there's a likelihood of consumer harm. And the others, other states kind of break down the harm question in two ways. Some of them say um, you shall provide notice unless there's no risk of harm, and others say you only have to provide notice if there is a risk of harm. And there's a different sort of burden in those two uh, harm-based standards. So the bottom line is I think what Congress ought to do, I hope it will do, is um, if it's going to take the time to enact a federal law, is to have one that has a robust standard. And if it has a robust standard, one that's protective of consumers, then I think we can begin to talk about preemption. On data security, I have a different view. And it, um, I'm sorry this is taking a little long, but it's actually you know, it's a complex question and it's hard to answer in one sentence. I think it's hard for companies to be expected to live up to different security standards based upon where their consumers are located. Notice is one thing. You know, we have a tradition in this country. There are TILA notices that go out to consumers in different states that say different things. Notices, I think you can do different notices to different uh, consumers based on, on different state jurisdictions. But having different security standards that's a different discussion. Right now, only one state has a substantive um, security standard. That's Massachusetts. Several other states have a law that say, well, you just have to have reasonable security, which isn't really much, you know, much of a substantive standard. So I think the preemption uh, point is much more salient when it comes to security as opposed to data breach notification. So somewhat longer answer, but a complicated and I think very important question. Can I probe a detail on that? Of course. Um, one of the things that I thought was fascinating about the panel this morning was the indication that it will be very difficult to tell where exactly either the security, where the breach is. I'll call it mm -hmm. a breach, whether we call mm -hmm. it a breach notification or a security problem, the way you've separated it. Um, so I'm going to come back to Bonnie's Pillow. And suppose Bonnie's Pillow is now programmed not just to say, um, how well I slept, but also who I was sleeping with. And now, my wife, by the way. Uh, and now um, that data stream, the manufacturer knows through various information that that data stream uh, can be and probably has been accessed mm -hmm. by a variety of third parties, say even the NSA. Um, in an instance like that, where would you, where would that really fall? Would it fall if it's breach notification? We also heard that the 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 uh, you know Bonnie doesn't know anything about the data that that's out there, so she's not holding the data. The pillow um, is in my possession. How would that fall out in this regime that you've just sketched out? I've I've got no idea. I mean, you know, it's a very interesting question. I mean, I, um, you know. The analogy, analogy to that question, or what's analogous to that, would be, um, you know, the, and this is not in a data breach context or data breach notification context, but there's a lot of sweeping of information that goes on. You know, if you saw the 60 Minutes segment with Ashkan Sultani using the Disconnect um, uh, uh, program to show how many entities are on websites sweeping up information, you know, that's that's not the um, online service provider that's necessarily voluntarily providing that information. It's being swept up. And um, uh, it's a very interesting question. Right now, data breach notification, I don't think for that reason, but I think because it, uh, data breach notification laws were developed at a, in a different era. Um, it was, they started back in like 2003, 2004, which is eons ago when we're talking about technology. Um, you know, they, they focus on things like, um, you know, financial uh, information, um, uh, name and social security number, things like that. They, they are, they're not now focused on the Internet of Things. And I think the question that's being raised here is, should that happen, and if so, how? So I don't, I don't have a, you know, I think we all need to think about that. I don't yet have an answer to that. Yes? Yeah. Let, let's get the mic. Sure. 
And then I know there's one or two over here. Thank you. And I, I thought that the, um, uh, particularly the proposal about the restriction on downstream entities was very sophisticated and reminds me a lot of the uh, new HIPAA omnibus rule with respect to covered entities and business associate agreements yes, in the yes. health context. Mm -hmm. The only worry I had was that uh, in the wake of the Office Max scandal with the uh, Mike daughter killed in car crash um, uh, CA, that the, the Office oh, yeah. Max sort of sent out this thing that said this that had on a mailing label that someone's daughter was killed in a car crash. That we tried to find out. Everyone's trying to find out. Kashmir Hill, Ryan Kahlo, all the superstars of privacy are trying to find out where did they get the data. They say we signed a confidentiality agreement with our the person who provided us the data. So the trade secrecy in the corporate context trumps the right of privacy of this family. And what my worry is, and what I'm wondering is, is how, what would we do in order to verify their promise that they had contracted with downstream entities not to re-identify, if we're in a data environment where everyone can say, I can't tell you where I got my data, you know, I signed an agreement, I'm protecting their privacy, or I'm protecting their trade secrecy. If we do that, then it seems though it's really hard to verify those sorts of commitments. So I, I think that's a really good point. And um, you know, what I'll say for now on this issue, and I might have more to say in about a month, um, but right now what I can, <laughs> what I can say right now is um, you know, our 2012 privacy report actually made recommendations along those lines with respect to data brokers and talked about the uh, ways in which, at, from a best practices perspective, Okay, not a legal requirement perspective, but a best practices perspective, data brokers should um, tell their data sources, or, I'm sorry, the entities that they give data to, not their sources, but the entities they give data to, that is their customers, that, that the customers should be disclosing where they get their data and should provide, that is, so um, let's say it's a retailer or something like that that's getting data from a data broker. That retailer should provide information to the consumers about the data that, that the retailer has, where they got it, and give the consumer the opportunity to, to make choices. And one of the reasons we made that as part of the recommendation, there are other recommendations that include responsibility of data brokers to disclose this information themselves and give consumers those choices. But one of the reasons we want to focus on the, the entities that purchase this information and use it is because they're often the consumer facing entity. So it's not, I'm not answer, I'm not, I'm not solving the problem. You're raising a very important point, but I am saying that we have identified this issue in the form of a best practice and made recommendations that the, the folks who are using the profiles, using the data broker information should make much more robust and more robust disclosures to consumers and be much more transparent about their data sources. Yeah, and then Steve. So we'll do the one up here and then right there. Hi. Um, I think not so long ago this question might have had nothing to do with the Internet of Things, but now I think it does. Um, and I think I can put it succinctly. Uh, are Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Amazon data brokers? Um, right now what I'm focused on is entities that self-identify as data brokers. There are a lot of entities that are out there that most consumers know nothing about that, you know, they might not, they might say that we're in the business of, you know, providing information data, you know, to, to our customers. They may not use the exact term of data brokers, but they know that that's what they are. And I think we can start to develop important transparency tools by looking at those entities, Axiom, Epsilon, Experian, um, Merkle. I mean, there's a bunch of them. Most people have never heard of them, again, because they're not consumer facing. I think that's where we need to start in terms of developing tools. I don't think we need to, I personally understand that there are a lot of people who say, look, if you start worrying about data brokers, you're talking about everybody. You're talking about everybody who's doing anything on the internet. I don't think we need to go there to start solving problems for consumers. And that's what I'm focused on. Steve? You're speaking about really three different kinds of information, stuff that's information that's directly given or taken, uh, given to a company or taken from a device, information that's uh, derived by merging databases, that's what the data brokers do, and then there's the predicted or inferred information, such as the target case. Right. Should the FIPS and the 
breach notification law apply to all three categories? So I, there's, the, the last. there's data broker, there's inferred information, and what was the oh, other well, the, category? There's the directly correct connect, directly collected, oh, there's okay. the data broker scenario, and then there's the uh, inferred or predicted data. Okay, so th there, I don't think the lines are that clear um, because, you know, data brokers collect online and offline information and they make inferences and they put consumers into segments like struggling second city, um, uh, rural, or there, there's, there's, some of the names are actually quite uh, catchy, you know, um, rural and swinging, I don't know, you know, and these all have, right, they all have meaning. I think I may be in rural and swinging, I don't know quite what it means myself, but it has meaning to the people who buy these things. Is that related to the pillow? No, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but uh, uh, so, so I don't think the categories are that clearly divided. Um, my view is the FIPS, which are principles, not law, clearly apply to all of these and, and should apply, in my view. Particularly, I mean, I am talking about inferred information as well as actually collected information. That's what the target pregnancy predictor score is. That's what much of the data broker enterprise is about. Um, and I think that's where we really need to focus. And, and the, the, the difficulty of it is, and I'm not saying that this is an easy problem, okay, but the difficulty is that a lot of this information can be inferred from very innocuous data you know, retail store purchases of lotions and, and creams and things like that um, with respect to the entity that, the company that I was referring to that, that um, helps find um, consumers to participate in medical trials. I mean, they were looking at social media and the level of like outdoors activity and exercise to infer obesity, apparently with fair amount of accuracy. So, you know, um, I think the ability to start making sensitive predictions about people based on innocuous data is just going to grow and grow, and it, and it will become more and more accurate. And that's why I think we need to start, I think the FIPS ought to apply, and I think we need to start figuring out what rules should be applying to that, the free-floating information about do we have diabetes, are we obese, do we have a mental illness, in the same way that we have rules in our society that come under HIPAA for, for covered entities. Entities, you know, doctors, offices, insurance companies, and whatnot. The, fr the data is flowing much more freely than, than, it ever, than anyone ever imagined back when HIPAA was written. And it's a siloed law. And now I think what we're seeing is, you know, either predictions about medical conditions or actual information about medical conditions that might not actually fall under HIPAA, but I think deserves some kind of protection. So I'm, 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 I'm not trying to avoid your question, other than to say that I think all of the categories need to be thought about deeply, and we need to develop some solutions around them. So uh, I'm going to... There's, there's one right oh, over there. Sorry, and sure. Whatever you like. Sure, sure. Along those lines, I mean, one of the things I would be most concerned about with the third category of data that Steve mentioned which is the predictive, intuitive right. data, is they're going to find out and figure out a lot of that information before I do. Sure. So you know, I might know who was sleeping on my pillow last night right. uh, and be able to correct that. But if they're able to predict who's going to be sleeping there next week before I do. That's what this is about. Yeah. Um, or a health condition, right? When we talk about all these uh, quantitative self devices that we're going to start wearing around. They're going to, oh, this guy is slowing down a little. Maybe he has a limp. He hasn't been sleeping well. They're going to be able to figure out things about me before I do. It's a whole other type of privacy. And how, under your Reclaim Your Name, I mean, how do you envision being able to correct something like that? If you got access to this database that says, I'm gay, and I call them and say, no, I'm not, they can come back and say, actually, you know, you downloaded this app. <laughs> you haven't figured you it were, out yet. Yeah, <laughs> you don't. Um, so I don't, um, I don't uh, hold out reclaim your name as answering all problems. I mean, I, I, you know, you're raising a really important issue. I do th I, I'm hopeful that um, as data brokers start to realize that they need to solve some of these problems, otherwise others are going to step in and solve it for them, um, that they need to provide some of these market-based solutions. And that's what reclaim your name really is. Uh, you know, I th what I am envisioning is that the creation or collection of 
sensitive information, and clearly, in my view, sexual orientation and um, health information fall into those categories, that um, consumers would have more uh, choices around them. So to the extent that it's going to be used for marketing, consumers could suppress it. To the extent that it is used for more substantive decisions, and the data brokers do um, silo their, their data buck, you know, cat, their data storehouses uh, in this way, if it's used for more sub substantive decisions, then I think consumers should have the right to correct it. And in that instance, well, I know, for instance, Axiom, which does have a portal that it offers to consumers now. It's called aboutthedata.com. And um, it, it provides some of what I'm talking about. It's just one data broker. And I really think all the major data brokers need to participate in one place, because consumers have no idea who these entities are. But one of the th interesting things that Axiom is doing, when consumers go in and correct the information, they, that uh, corrected information, the consumer offered information, if you will, overrides anything else. And um, Axiom has said that they are going to use this as a marketing tool to show that their database is better. Frankly, if you go in and you look at it, you'll see, most, for most people, a lot of it's inaccurate. This is, again, it's just marketing data, and it's only some of the marketing data. And they claim all their other um, uh, data buckets are, are, are much more accurate, which I'm sure they are, frankly. But um, they uh, say that in the marketing space, if consumers override what's in there, that that will trump anything else that comes in, and that that will lead to greater accuracy. Now, it doesn't answer your point, which is uh, th the ability, which I believe is coming, to make future predictions that are going to be, that, where consumers don't even realize that's where they're heading. Um, I don't have an answer yet to that, but it's a really interesting question. At least consumers should be able to look at what's currently being said about them, and I think, to the extent that it's sensitive, they should have the ability to correct it. So I'll, I'll get the last question. <clears throat> um, it's always fun when we have an FTC commissioner to try to push on things that the FTC might think about or might be able to do. So my takeaway from um, the sessions this morning are there are all sorts of really cool things that are happening in the development space but with a lot of scary attributes to it. And I think of, um, I'm going to use Dale's uh, to-do list. Right, her to-do list and, and the color coding on the light can indicate whether I'm a type A personality or a procrastinator. So if I think about that sort of contrast, and I think about the use that we saw this morning was really very much a personal use. And I look at the two of the comments that were made um, on the regulation panel. One was by Scott, talking about pushing toward use restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, and the second was Mark Geisfeld's comment about the fact that duties may be increased now because of the way the connectivity is functioning and creating uh, easier capabilities to fix, to identify where harm might be occurring. And I wonder if sort of putting these different pieces together, whether it suggests that the role of the FTC in this space may wind up focusing very heavily on the unfairness jurisdiction. That, and is this something you think that the FTC um, might be able to uh, pursue while legislation may be pending uh, in, in terms of focusing use restrictions. I don't know how we would go about uh, legislating use restrictions in a timely fashion. We know that the, using the, the, the driving score uh, as an insurance index, we can find an isolated thing, but till the law gets passed, it's a while. Uh, on the other hand, there's so many different uses. You're kind of at a front line. Could an unfairness authority work here? Well, we, we use our unfairness jurisdiction. I mean, you know, we don't just use deception. And I'm constantly telling um, my European colleagues who uh, think, you know, think largely that what we focus on is deception. I think we're using our unfairness jurisdiction appropriately, judiciously. Um, but, you know, we, we are using it. And I, I wouldn't want to say that I favor unfairness over deception or deception over unfairness, it would be like trying to pick which of my two sons I love the most. I love them equally. Um, so, uh, you know, unfairness may have a role to play, uh, but it's so context dependent. I mean, we, you know, I, I, I can't sit here and say unfairness will solve, or our use of unfairness jurisdiction will solve all the issues that I was raising or that were raised this morning. I think we, we are using it judiciously and appropriately and, and thinking hard about when uh, it can serve the purpose of focusing on kind of a, a, a new use. I mean, clearly we've talked 
about um, material changes in data and using data in a very different way than um, had been uh, than consumers had been informed about um, as being uh, an unfair use. So even though you didn't say it, it won't be used in that way, um, material changes is, un is an unfair practice. And we've used unfairness in other, I think, appropriately creative ways. I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not going to let you pin me down. You can try all you want, <laughs> but I'm not going to do it because it is one of the, one of the beauties of um, the FTC Act, and I, I really do believe this, that um, you know, Congress, 100 years ago, we're now 100 years old, and originally we were just focused on competition, and then in the 30s, in the height of the Depression, we um, received our uh, consumer protection mandate. But by saying that um, unfair and deceptive acts and practices in commerce shall be prohibited or shall not be allowed, it was designed to be broad and remedial and allowed to expand when new technologies came about. So that's what we do, is we use it you know, in, in appropriately um, new contexts. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Commissioner Brill. Let me ask if the next panel could come right up, please. <laughs>